What we're going to look at today is last week was God is faithful. This week is God is in control. Now, I know some of y'all's mind automatically went to the contemporary gospel song, you know, or God is in control. You know, maybe it didn't, maybe it was just me. Um, that's, what, that's, that's the way my mind works. We're going to be in Psalms chapter 91. And I want to do some speed reading a little bit this morning because we're going to read the entire chapter. Now, I know some of you are kind of like, oh my goodness, how come we didn't go to 23 or something? There's only six verses. This ain't going to be too bad. Um, we're going to look at several things listed in the scripture to kind of draw out what God is. Um, let me just go ahead and start reading. Psalms chapter 91, and uh, you can find your way there, and we'll just start reading it here now. It says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the uh, noisome pestilence. He, he shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid in the terror by night. night. I, did you hear that? Not? <laughs> Sorry about that. That was the South Alabama version. That nor by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him, and I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. I don't know if you kind of caught that towards the end. Uh, but there towards um, verse number 14, we see a switch in the narrative. That it goes from the, the psalmist writing and saying, look, here's my God, here's who He is, here's what He's going to do for you. And then the last couple of verses, it's almost like God intervenes and says, let me say a few words. You know? And He says, this is what I'm going to do you know, for these people. And I will set Him up on high and I will do these things. And God interjects. How, how many have you ever had God interject into your life? Right? How many have times have you started saying something you're like, this is what I'm going to plan on doing, this is what I'm going to say, and then God lets us kind of go like we, we studied with uh, Job a few months ago, and it's kind of like these are things that are being said, and all of a sudden God says, may I say a word? Boom! Here it is. You know? And when he says it, he says it with such with, with divineness and almightiness and holiness and all powerfulness in such a way that we're just like, Maybe I should have just not said the first 13 verses and just let you speak for two. Because when God speaks, you know, it's amazing what happens. Now, here's the awesome, cool thing about this, is that verses 1 through 13 is still the words of God. You know, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's powerful, you know, for, for, for instruction, for correction, for re rebuke, and, and for that we're, everything that we're supposed to learn in life, we can learn through the word of God, applying it into our life. You say, no, wait a second. I got a 401k and I'm trying to figure out if I'm going to withdraw that and put it in an IRA and do this. Now, where in the Word of God does it say for me to do that? The words 401k does not exist in the Word of God. Okay? But he that lacketh wisdom, let him ask of God and he give it to all men liberally and upright at night. Okay? God can give us wisdom in aspects of our life in such a way that, you know, maybe it's not best to withdraw that and put it over here. Maybe it's you know, best to just leave it where it's at. Maybe, and some of you, I don't know if you came in asking about 401k questions this morning. You know, but that was just that was off the top of the head. But the thing is that when we apply scripture to our life, that's the key. 
See, it's all here. Dan's even said it the other night. You know, everything that we need an answer for is here. The problem is the application of it. So here's what we're going to get out of this. It, you know, that God is in control. You're like, okay, now I believe in a supreme God. I believe that He is Almighty. I believe that He's all knowing. I believe that He can do whatever He wants to do. Right? And so some people look at it and they're like, well, God is in control. That means He He drives me. He makes me do everything I do. Can we go back to the book of Genesis? All right, because if we go back to the book of Genesis, God says, "But touch not, or eat not of the tree that's in the middle of the garden." Right? Only one thou shalt not. You are complete. You know, you know. Some people are like, you know, I don't believe in that Christianity stuff because there's all these thou shalt nots. It doesn't matter even if we just have one. We're still going to mess it up big time, right? And even when God says, "This is what I don't want you to do." This is what I want you to do. The vastness of the world at your fingertips. Take yeah. care of this garden. Enjoy the paradise. It, just don't do that. Even with that free will, we messed up. And even today, in our life, we, want, we would desire, let me, let's be completely honest with each other, that one of the reasons we want God to control everything is because we want to be able to blame God for everything. <laughs> Come on now. Can I be a little honest this morning? It's kind of like, you know, Skip Wilson many, many years ago had the, the popular phrase, but the devil made me do it. But how much more powerful would it be to say, well, God made me do it? No, he didn't. You stepped into that mess yourself. But God is in control. And I want to show you some things even out of the scripture. I want you to kind of put a star beside that chapter number. I want you to kind of mark that page. Put, pull out your little, you know, little doohickey thing. That's what that's the technical word for that. The little doohickey, your page marker there, or the little crosses that you know Miss Doris and Miss Morgan made. You want to put that there because I want you to refer back to chapter ninety-one time and time and time and time again. Why? Because in this chapter, if you're anxious, if you're nervous, if you're scared, if you're frightened, if you're discouraged, if you're dismayed, if you're disgusted, if you're in disarray, you're dismantled, you're destroyed, all those D words, you know, any of those, if you, you can go here to chapter 91 and you can find comfort, you can find release, you can find joy, you can find re relaxation even, and knowing that God is God and He is in control. You say, how in the world can we find all this? Your world, uh, casting crowns has a song out there, and uh, there's this phrase that's used in here. It says, your world's not falling apart, it's falling into place. I'm on the throne, stop holding on, and just be held. That's basically what this chapter's saying. It's because how many times do we struggle to hold on to that last knot on the rope, right? And, there, you know, and so many times, the problem is that when we hold on to the rope, it ends up causing us more damage then we would just let go and let God. Now, I don't want to say that as the, the Christian cl cliche phrase, you know, that we're going to make t-shirts out of. You know, it's like, you know, just let go and let God, which is cool. It's even more amazing in application. When you allow God to do His mighty work in our life. This passage of Scripture, it go, it, it, the reason this passage of Scripture is so, so impressive is because the psalmist, he understood exactly what he was saying here because he had battled each of the things that we're about to talk about. In this passage of Scripture, verse number 2, it says that I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge. He is my refuge. And you say, what is the refuge? Now, if you go to the Old Testament, you look at the book of Deuteronomy, there were Levitical cities that were built, you know, that had high priests that lived in these things. And if there was a time that uh, in your life where you were accused of manslaughter, you accidentally killed somebody, it wasn't right out murder. It was like you, you were driving your camel too fast and you hit him or something. I don't know. You know but, you know, from different things, it was an accident. But nonetheless, it was manslaughter. And the family was coming after you. You could flee to the city of refuge, and you could go there, and you could basically hide out, if you will. You could go there, and you could live, and you could stay there until the high priest died. When the high priest died, you could leave the city and never be touched by those that were seeking vengeance against you. That's impressive, right? Because sometimes accidents happen. But the enemy is coming at you and it's kind of like, whoa, hey, you know, the enemy of your life, you know, is now this, this, those that are seeking vengeance. 
So this refuge, you want to look at this, is this is when I do wrong. When I do wrong, I have a refuge. You have to let me know that I did wrong. I don't have to judge you to let you know that you did wrong. Let's face it, we already know. Do we not? Many times, why? Because sin in our life is nothing more than a choice that we make. Knowing that we do wrong. You know, somebody that decides to, let's say they go into a big box store and they decide that, hey, I'm going to take this 55-inch TV and I'm going to walk out the door with it without paying for it. That doesn't happen without somewhere down the line they looked at a 70-cent candy bar and said, I'll take that. And they made that choice. And then the candy bar turned into a drink and a candy bar. And the drink and a candy bar turned into a sub, sub sandwich and a candy bar. Then it became a t-shirt. Then it became a pair of pants to go with it and a hat. Then it, I would say a tie, but there's only one person in this building that's wearing a tie today, and he's super cool for doing so. You know, and it's like, you know, that it, 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 it's a process of choices in our life that get to a point that we're like, you know what? Maybe I feel like I didn't choose to do wrong, but really I did. If we start to evaluate it, he that knoweth to do good and doeth not to him, it is what? It is sin. Sean has a song. He hasn't sung it here yet. I've been asking him to sing some of his originals, uh, but he hasn't done any of them yet. One of the ones he has is called uh, uh, You're My Refuge. And it's a really, really cool song because it talks about how that we make choices in life and we stumble and we fall. You know, we can find refuge in him. Why? Because we already know that he knows that we're wrong, but he accepts us anyway. You know, when those people showed up at the door of these cities of refuge and they were banging on the door and they keep looking over their shoulder, you know, when the, you know, when the Levitical priest would open the door and they would bring these guys in, they didn't have to stand them before a court, a court of peers and say, all right, now let's evaluate if you're guilty or wrong, if you're doing it. No, that was already established. We know we do wrong. But this refuge that we have is a place that we can come and even though we do wrong, we can resist the, the, people, the things that were coming against us on the outside. Psalm chapter 46, verses 1 through 3 says this. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And he goes on to explain some more about that. I love that very verse because it says, a very present help in times of trouble. Right? And I look at that and I'm like, how, how come? And, you know, in my version, that they inserted, they put this, the, the word very. Because I'm very much in the wrong. <laughs> many times, and I very badly need some help. So he's a very present help in time of trouble. Verily, as in truly, as in established, as in matured, as in perfect help in time of trouble. How many of you need help? Okay, let me answer that for you. Every one of us. Okay? We all need help. We all have issues in life, right? We all do wrong from time to time. And it's what a blessing to know that God is our refuge. All right, now let me, kind of, let me just kind of throw this out to you. Here's a little nugget that you're just going to go, boom, wow, this is awesome. All right, I told you about how Deuteronomy established the, the city of refuge. And that you can go there and you can hide out and you can be, be safe from harm, you know, from the enemy as long as the high priest is alive. And then when he dies, you're set free. The Bible refers to Jesus Christ as our high priest. Okay? Now you're going to get this here in a second. Alright? And you're just like, whoa, 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 Jesus died. Yes, 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 he did. Before the crucifixion, the Old Testament saints would go to where? Abraham's bosom. Paradise. They could not leave and abide into the abode of God. Why? Because they were still with sin. You say, wait, wait, wait. The ultimate sacrifice had not yet been applied. Their sin was in remission. Some of us understand that. We, you know, with cancer, it's still there. It's just not growing. It's in remission, right? You still have it. It's just not, you know, it's not just not, it's just not festering on itself. The same thing with sin. Until the perfect sacrifice could be made, and the high priest died, they couldn't leave their city of refuge and be free. You with me? All right. Now we will be going to our city of refuge. And our high priest will never die. All right. So what's that mean? Is that as long as he's alive, I don't have to worry anymore about having to give an account for the wrong that I did. 
never ever again will the outside forces seek to do me harm, the devil, hello, against me, against my soul. Why? Because my high priest lives forever. Mm. Oh, I got a clap out of that one. That was awesome. As I was writing, you know, and I, and I was writing things down, and I'm writing my, my last thoughts, if you will, on Saturday night, and I'm writing down, and I try to keep it on one page, and I, I look back, and I told Annette, I was like, oh. and she's like, what? I said, it drifted over into two pages. This is cool, you know, because I got thinking about that, and I got thinking about the high priest and the city of refuge, and I was like, man, if there's ever a worse judge, if there's ever a worse yeah. critic about me, it's me. I don't need you to judge me. I'm my worst judge. And when I stand before myself and I look in the mirror and you know and I, things when I do wrong and stuff and I look back in the mirror, I'm like, man, you are a wicked, vile, you know, just disgraceful human being. Now y'all are looking at me like, what kind of pastor have we got? <laughs> but can we be honest this morning? Yeah. We're all like that. How awesome is it that I know that I can go to my city of refuge? my refuge which is my God and I don't have to answer for those wrongs because why because he says you know what as long as you're with me I got you good you know you did wrong that's why you sought me out you repented you came to me and now you know oh man that's good stuff we got to go on I can go on there all day Verse number two, not only it says that he's my refuge, it says, and my fortress. See, the first one was when I do wrong. The second one is when wrong is against me and attacking. And how many of you have been attacked by the devil just in the last week? All right? Month, year, whatever. Yeah. How many times do we, we look at the and it's like, all right, I mean I got my got my church on on Sunday, I got my Bible going, you know, I got my K Love playing or my Power ADA, whatever the case may be. Uh, or if you're good closer to Pensacola, I got my you know, wow. And it's kinda like, well, all right, got this going on and you know, I am I'm, I'm, you know, doing devotions, doing studies, I, I got all this Jesus stuff coming in, you know, I'm you know, I'm getting my Jesus fixed every oh, this is good stuff. And then all of a sudden it's just like this one billboard that you've never seen before is like right there. And it's like, boom, and it's not Alexander Shinar, and right? It's like something else. And you're like, oh, I didn't know they were having that kind of contest down at the beach this weekend. <laughs> right? And then you, you go to work or you, you, you pull up Facebook and all of a sudden one of your friends posts something, you know, that's kind of like, you know, find out what happens behind the closed doors. And you're like, I don't need to see that junk. We just know things about right? Right. Pizza and you start hiding friends because of things that's on that. And then you get on the internet and pop-ups start coming up and, and things in your life. And, and friends start talking around the water cooler at work. And, or maybe just... Maybe just in the quietness and you're not out in the public. And maybe just the devil comes upon you in your private time. And, you, and it's like, you're weak, you're weary, you're, you're no good, you're just filthy, you're wretched, you're vile. Why not just live like that anyway? Because you're not really a child of God. Am I the only one that gets attacked like that? No. We all do. But how awesome it is that we have a fortress. What is a fortress, a fortress for? It's to fortify those that are within from those that are without. Amen? Against attacks from the outside. And we get them. Some of us on a daily basis. And here he is. He's saying he is our fortress, our protection. Mikey, uh, most of you know him, he's a Tuesday nighter uh, every other Sunday because of work and stuff. And he does a YouTube video uh, out there called Disciple Ministries. And he basically speaks encouragement into people's life. And uh, if you get a chance, you can watch him on YouTube. And you just sit there, and Michael Townsend is his whole name. And you, and you sit there and watch him. Last night he posted one out, and it was on Ephesians chapter 6 talking about the armor of God. And it was almost about the exact same time that I was on Fortress. You know, and because my thing, I subscribe to him, so it pops up as soon as he downloads it. You know, so I pulled up and I started watching it, and I got him playing while I'm reading and I'm writing and stuff like that. And I'm writing down this stuff and I'm listening to him, and I'm like, oh, this is good. This is good. Because, you know, to be fortified and to be fortified with the, arm, the armor of God, 
when the devil attacks. You know, let me give you this, that when you're inside the fortress and the devil attacks and the outside enemy attacks, where, where are you supposed to be? Inside the fortress. You're going to find yourself, and I had so many people try to say, Brother Keon, I don't understand. We're trying to walk the straight and narrow. We're trying to get back in church. We're trying to do what's right. But it seems like every time we do, the devil just starts, you know, it just saying things are against us. If the devil's fighting against you, it's probably because you're in the right place. If you're inside the fortress, guess where the attacks are going to be centered towards? The fortress, to where you are. Right? If you're out there walking with the enemy, siding with the enemy, playing games with the enemy, playing tic-tac-toe and cornhole, whatever the case may be, guess what? The enemy's not going to be attacking you. Why? Because you're not their enemy. So if the devil's not attacking you, that might be some wake-up calls to take into consideration. Because any old dead fish can float downstream. Right? But if you find that the devil is constantly attacking you, maybe it's because your life is exactly where it's supposed to be. Amen. Now, you can find encouragement in that, or you can be like, oh, great. If I'm where I'm supposed to be, that means I can expect more attacks from the devil. Yeah. But what better place to be than in the fortress of the Almighty? Amen. That we find our protection. We find that He is there willing to deliver us, which brings up verse number three. And it says that surely He shall deliver thee. He is our deliverer. He's in control. Why? Because he's our refuge. He's our fortress. And then he delivers. He, the, he delivers us. And this one here, the first one was the enemy within, if you will. The second one is the enemy without attacking us. The third one is the enemy unseen. Look at this. He says this in verse number three. He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. How many of you are hunters? Okay. Technically not, but technically no. <laughs> all right, used to be, all right, uh, used to do, do some hunting, quite a bit of hunting, you know, growing up and uh, early you know, up in Memphis, you, you like hunting? Yeah, this is right. I had, a, I had a guy that, uh, he was a homeless man and, uh, you know, that God put in our, in our path years ago, and uh, he didn't have any income of the land. And one thing he would do is he would build rabbit traps. I don't know if you've ever seen rabbit traps or anything like the boxes with a little stick in there and they go in and it traps and it traps them alive. You know? And he would build these things in such a way that if you walked up on it, you wouldn't know it. Right? Now they wouldn't hurt you because you know, it takes for the animal to go inside. And it wouldn't kill the animal, it would trap them alive. And so he would build these things and he would paint them in such a way that they blended in with the natural surroundings. But to the natural element, the rabbit, it was detrimental. Right? Can I tell you this? That the devil's not going to come to you as uh, as a, in, in a horns and pitchfork, you know, in a, in a bright red jumpsuit. Okay? He's not. He's not going to stand before you and say, I am Lucifer, you will listen to me. I don't know why he talked like Arnold Schwarzenegger. But anyway, you know, but he's not going to do that. He's not going to jump in your face and say, look, I'm going to tempt you. No, the Bible says that he will come as an angel of light, as, as a deceiver. That he will come, you know, as a roaring lion, but he didn't see anyone made devour. But he will come to deceive you. He's not going to lay traps in your path that you can obviously see and say, Whoa, hey, hey, that's a trap of the devil. I'm just going to walk around this. Or God build a bridge over it. Or, you know, no, you're going to be going about your daily life just you know, just as commonality and just going through things, and next thing you know, bam. Maybe you weren't walking where you're supposed to walk, but you didn't see the trap that was set before you. If you see a trap, I don't know if you have, how many of you had siblings or something that were pranksters? Alright? Or you were the prankster. Alright? Oh, there we go. Now we're starting to see more hands come up. Nah, let me write this down. Alright. Um, but, you know, you walk into a room and it's like you, you start to get leery and you start looking for signs of booby traps and stuff like that, you know, strings around the doorknob and, you know, pellets of water in places they shouldn't be and, you know, you started to check the end of the toilet seat each time, you know, make sure it wasn't saran wrapped or anything like that or, you know, you just started, you started to learn over a period of time being around those pranksters that you started to look for signs of the traps ahead of you, right? 
I want to tell you that the devil is sly. Matter of fact, his very first temptation to Eve was that he was getting her to question the Word of God. Using parts of God's Word, but twisting it in such a way to make her say, wait, maybe he didn't quite say it like that. The devil is smart. He is cunning. He is sly. And he would do everything in his power to trip us up. The Bible also says here, not only the snare of the fowler, but it also says that the, the noise of pestilence, the plague, the disease, if you will. And how many of us, it's, it's, let's just take cancer because that is a, a very prominent thing you know, in this day and time, right? There's not a sign that shows up on your body. There's not a tattoo that shows up across your chest that says cancer present as soon as you get cancer. No, usually we find out later down the road, right? We Usually there's something that we have a test or something, and the doctor comes in and says, look, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you got cancer. Wait, 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 how long have I had that? Well, like in my case, you know, the doctor's like, well, how long do you have that on your face? Oh, maybe seven years. Okay, well, you've had it for seven years. <laughs> it's like, but I didn't know it was cancer. It wasn't something that said, hey, you have skin cancer. <laughs> I just thought I had itchy skin. And then after tests are shown, then it's like, hey, that was there this whole time. The devil sneaks in like that as well. But God is a deliverer from the things that are unseen. If we would put our hope and our trust in Him, if we dwell in the high place of the Almighty. See, a lot of these are conditional on verse number one, that he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. If we want to be under the delivering hand of God, if we want to be under the protective hand of God, if we want to be under the refuge of God, we have to abide where? In God. Which brings up point number four. Not only is our, he our deliverer, our fortress, and our refuge, but he is by control. He can't have control if he is our habitation. Our habitation. Habitation means, you can see that in verse number 9. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thine habitation. Habitation is the, the act of uh, inhabiting or the state of being inhabited. Which I kind of find that that's pretty cool, both in the same definition. Because that's exactly how we should be. That He's in us, and we should be in Him. Amen? That our life should be centered around Him, and you know He, we, he finds our, His place in us. Now let me go back to the Old Testament again. And in the Old Testament, you know, God has given Moses the direction and the, build, the blueprint, if you will, on how to build the tabernacle. And he goes and he says, okay, build the courtyard, build the, you know, build the altar, build this, build that. And he goes, build the holy place. And then I want you to build the holy of holies. And behind the veil, in the holy of holies, that's where the Ark of the Covenant was. And in the middle of the Ark of the Covenant, between the cherubs that were on the Ark of the Covenant, right there on earth dwelt the presence of God. Now, the earth in itself cannot contain the presence of God, okay? But he chose to find his place right there. The glory of God bowed with man right there. And as everything else was going on around the outsides of, of, of the curtains, outside the, the courtyard, outside the, the compound, and, and amongst the tents and the life of the people that was going on, right there in their presence was the glory of God. They lived around the presence of God. And the presence of God lived in the midst of them. And as long as God was there, they had everything they needed by the hand of God. They had the protection. They had the provision. They had all these things. Protection from the enemy. As long as the presence of God existed right there. They found their inhabitation around him. And they were inhabited by him. When we find our place, when we find ourselves in our life, that we look and we say, you know what, he needs to be what? Our dwelling place. He needs to be, we, we need, this body needs to be his tabernacle. He needs to find a place in here, an abode of God. Now that's huge. 
Now I can get I can get carried away real quick and start talking about how that in our body is this, this typology of the tabernacle of the Old Testament and how we have the outer courts and the inner courts and the holy place and the holy of holies and somewhere inside of us and so you can start to get carried off right you know it's somewhere inside of us that there is a place inside of us where the glory of God abides. That's fascinating to me. But where I come in is do I find myself abiding in the presence of God? Do I find myself every single day striving to be inside the Holy of Holies with Him? Do I find myself, or, or do I find myself going around the, the courtyard? Do I find myself even outside of a fence and saying, "Wow, hey, yes, I, man, I, just like the children of Israel could easily march around the, 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 the compound and they could go around and they could say, "Hey, I am in the presence of God." That's cool. But there was one individual that at certain times of the year that he could go and he could take the incense and he could take the coal from the altar. And he can take the blood and he can go behind the curtain and step into the very presence of God. That's different than little, pick a name, Moses Jr., outside of the curtain, outside of the courtyard, outside amongst the people. He can say, yes, I'm in the presence of God. But there was an individual that can say, I am in the very presence of the Almighty God. We can say that. We can find ourselves not just on the outside looking in, not just in the courtyard, not just in the holy place, and even around the tables and the altars and stuff, that we can find ourselves, because the veil's been ripped from top to bottom, it's been ripped in, in, in half, and we can go boldly before the throne of grace, and we can find ourselves in the very direct divine presence of God. Mmm! That's good stuff. He is in control not only as my refuge and my fortress and my deliverer, but I pray that I find my habitation in him. Why? Because my life changes in his presence. My attitude changes around you guys because y'all bring joy into my life. Y'all do. But there's something about when I get in the presence of God that everything changes. Or as they say, like in the commercials, this changes everything. When we find our habitation in Him. Is God in control of your life? Can you honestly say, you know, God, you know, God has, has complete authority over every aspect of my life. That when I make a decision, my first point of my decision is this. The first question, the first precedence that I must say is what I'm going to do going to bring glory to God? You say, hey, pick something. Let me pick something. All right, I posted a video earlier this morning because you know, I was talking to some friends. And I posted a video about a guy that was marlin fishing on a sea egg. That's cool. Right? You know, and, and I was like, man, that, that is pretty cool. And I let me just use this as an example. If I wanted to go marlin fishing on a sea dew, and I say, is that going to give glory to God? It can. But what if I'm supposed to be standing right here? What if I'm supposed to be doing something else for Him? There's nothing wrong with marlin fishing on a sea dew, unless God wants you to do something else. You see what I'm saying? You say, you say, so many times we look at things and we're like, well, it's not necessarily a sin. Yeah, but is it what God wants you to do? Is that what God wants you to do in your family? Is that what God has directed for you? First and foremost, let me say this, that it is God's desire, first of all, that you become a child of God. God's top priority for your life is that you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And I've heard a lot of different discussions. Man, there's a lot of stuff going on, you know, in the pastor and evangel uh, evangelist world right now of, you know, do we pray a prayer and all this stuff? Do we ask God to come into our heart and save us and all this? And it's kind of like, let's just do what the Bible says, okay? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, with a heart, man believes in the righteous, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Basically, it comes down to this, that you have to cry out to God and say, and repent. And say, God, I'm a sinner. 
He knows that. He just wants you to realize that. God, I'm a sinner. And that Savior is Jesus Christ. However you accept it, however you pray it, it's got to be with repentance and a heart that is given over to Him. Amen. Amen. There's no little magic phrase for us to use. But with a heart, you know, we believe in righteousness and say, God, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. Jesus is that Savior. I need to be saved. Wash me. Make me new. It's as simple as that. Admit we're a sinner. Believe that Jesus lived, died, and rose again according to Scripture and confess to Him our sins. Maybe you're at that point in your life where you're like, okay, yeah, I've done that. And again, I, I, I've accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. The second thing God wants is that not only does He want us to recognize the Savior of Jesus Christ, but He also wants to recognize the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Is Jesus the Lord of your life? Are you allowing Him to lead you in the way that you should go? Acknowledge Him and He shall direct our paths. Maybe you're at that point in your life you say, you know what, I need to, I need to refocus on that. Or, you know, a good Bible word that's used, or a little Christianese, if you will, is that we rededicate our life to Christ. And say, you know what, God, I, I've done it my way for many years. I'm coming back to you. I'm walking the new walk. I'm with you. You are now my Lord once again. Maybe that's where we're at this morning. Maybe you're at that place where you're like, God, I just need some wisdom. I need, to, I need focus. I need wisdom. I need to make right decisions, good decisions. God help me on every aspect of my life. Maybe that's where you're at this morning. Let's pray and we'll get into prayer time. Father God, God, we ask you to help these words. God, we pray that it was an encouragement to each of us. That God, it, to know that we are not in control whatsoever. We make choices, we make decisions. But God, a lot of those are haphazard. God, a lot of those are just off the cuff and fly by night stuff. God, we don't give thought to it. God, we pray that you would help us to, to just take a step back and think. To slow down the process and allow you to direct in our lives. God, we pray during this prayer time that whatever people need, that God, that they will find it here this morning. In Christ's name we do pray.